Hello. In this lecture, I'll be talking about MRI pulse sequences for neuroimaging research, and in particular, I'll be introducing the concept of case space. I ended the lecture on MRI basics image formation with this figure here, where I was showing how the magnetization vectors are twisted up by the frequency encoding along the x-axis here, and by the different phase encoding steps along the y-axis here. So putting this together, if we have multiple different phase encoding steps, if we look at the frequencies within each of these echoes, we can find out where the signal is coming from in the x direction. And similarly, if we look at the frequencies across all the different phase encoding steps, we can find out where the signal is coming from in the y direction. So this in the middle image that you see right here is what we call k-space, the set of these signals that we've acquired. Now, the way that this k-space is related to the real space is via a Fourier transform. That is, if we look at the frequencies within our actual image, that's what the image looks like. Generally, the uh, center of k-space is the brightest that we have where we have zero frequency or very small frequencies, and the, uh, the k-space gets a bit uh, lower amplitude as we go out uh, to the higher frequencies. So going from the k-space to the real space, we would apply a Fourier transform and vice versa. We can go back to the k-space with a Fourier or an inverse Fourier transform. Now, the reason I'm uh, introducing this concept is because it's really helpful to understand that what we're, really, what we're doing with MRI is we're acquiring the data in k-space. And knowing that, there's a lot of different ways that we can acquire the data or sample uh, all of k-space in order to create our image. So let's take a look at the first one, and that is the simple gradient echo sequence, which I introduced in the basics of the image formation. On the left here, you can see a schematic of essentially uh, over time what we are doing with our radio frequency pulse and the gradients along the z, y, and x axes. So generally the first step in a two-dimensional imaging acquisition technique is that you apply a gradient during the RF excitation. This excites just a slice of the image. And the other key concept to note is that the K space, that is how we're moving across K space, is proportional to the integral of these gradients over time. That is, it's essentially the area um, of these uh, gradient waveforms as we're progressing forward in time. So let's see what happens after with the excitation. Uh, we've excited that 2D slice that plops us down into the center of k-space. Then you notice we have a negative gradient in the x and in the y direction. This is our phase encoding and our frequency encoding gradient that moves us in the negative direction in both kx and ky. So we move down here. Now this is turned back into a positive direction. The y gradient is turned off, so we don't move anymore along the y direction and then we scan along in the x direction. And during this time, we acquire the signal. Then we wait some period of time. We re-excite the data that puts us down in the center of k-space. We have a slightly smaller phase encoding gradient, so that puts us a little bit less far away in the ky direction. And again, we have the positive x, kx direction, uh, the gradient in x direction, and we're acquiring this data uh, and uh, the next line of k-space and so on. And so in this way, we can essentially collect all the different lines in k-space, and by doing a Fourier transform, we can then uh, recover our image from this. Let's take a look at the spin echo. Uh, somewhat similar, after the 90 degree pulse, we've excited the spins that puts us in the center of k-space. We then apply a gradient in both the x and the y direction that moves us, in this case, now in the positive x and the y direction, because we have a positive gradient. What the 180 degree pulse does is it actually flips us to the other side of k-space. So we move to the other side of k-space, and now we've got a positive gradient, and during this time we acquire our signal, and we move to the right in the k-space. And then we repeat this for different amounts of phase encoding, acquiring the different lines in k-space. Now let's look at some other ways that we might be able to sample uh, k-space. One would be the projection reconstruction that I had mentioned earlier. That is, instead of acquiring uh, different phase encoding steps, we just rotate the direction of these gradients and therefore acquire different spokes uh, of this uh, radial projections. Uh, and then we could do a, uh, either radon transform or regrid it uh, in order to uh, create our actual image. Another technique that's actually used quite commonly for functional MRI and also for diffusion tensor imaging is what's called echo planar imaging. So this is what the waveform looks like on the right. Let's take a look at that in more detail. So we excite the spins that puts us in the center of k-space. And then shortly after that, 
this should be just shifted over a little bit, but we have the gradients in the negative x and y directions. And that moves us uh, down here in the negative x and y direction in k space. Now we start acquiring our data. And you can see now we go to a positive lobe in the x direction. So that moves us to the right. And now we've got this small little blip here in the y direction. So that just moves us a little bit further into the y direction. And now we reverse a gradient in the x. That means we scan back. And you can see we repeat this backwards and forwards scan. And the benefit here is that within a single RFX citation, we're acquiring the entire image. So this is very efficient. Uh, whereas the previous gradient echo technique that I talked about, it takes us several minutes to acquire a whole volume. So maybe tens of seconds to a minute to collect a slice. In this case, we're actually acquiring the entire slice in about you know, 20 to 40 milliseconds. And the entire volume of the head we can get in approximately a second or two, depending on the resolution. What's interesting is this particular technique was actually suggested uh, by Peter Mansfield uh, right after the discovery of magnetic resonance imaging or the development of magnetic resonance imaging, but they actually didn't have the technology at the time to drive the gradients this quickly in order to actually create an image. Uh, the gradient, the acquisition would just be way too long and you'd be, have no signal left by the time you got through acquiring all of K-space. Nevertheless, he proposed this technique and then several decades later, we actually had the technology to make this happen and acquire these echo player images. Now, another technique we could use to uh, acquire an entire plane of the image in one excitation is what's shown here, this spiral sequence. So again, right after excitation, that is, uh, we apply the RF pulse, we excite a certain slice that puts us in the center of K-space. And then you can see these uh, gradients oscillating and increasing in amplitude, moving us in a spiral pattern further and further out. Now, one thing I should note here is that the echo time is generally defined in this, uh, these sequences as the time from when you excite till when you collect the center of K-space. And the reason for that is that most of the signal, as you saw in the previous slides, is at the center of K-space. So if we started the spiral out um, right after the excitation, we would have a pretty short echo time. Now you can actually flip this around and instead, you know, after the excitation, have some sort of gradient that moves us out in say the X direction and then spiral in the other direction, spiral in, just flipping these waveforms here. And in that case, we would actually have a longer echo time uh, because we're acquiring that center of K space later. So a more efficient way of collecting, uh, say having a, a longer echo time acquisition. Uh, I should also note, we've been talking so far about 2D imaging sequences. Uh, it is also possible to collect the data in 3D using additional uh, phase encoding in that third dimension. So instead of just having the phase encode uh, in the Y direction, here you'd have additional steps where you also vary uh, the phase encoding in the Z direction. And so each time you would excite, you would exciting not just a single slice, but rather you're exciting a slab or the entire brain volume, and then you're doing phase encoding both in the Y direction and in the Z direction. Now, a few properties of K-space I think is important to understand. Now, as I mentioned, the K-space is we're looking at these spatial frequencies in data. So if I were to just acquire or just look at the center of K-space, that is just the lowest frequencies, what would you get? well, you would get a slightly blurrier image. And that's what I'm showing here on the right. Uh, this is just a picture of me. And you can see if I just uh, crop out, just take the center of case space and, and reconstruct that, do a Fourier transform, it looks a little bit like a blurry a picture of a face. Now, if instead I remove the center and then just take a Fourier transform, just look at what's information out here in the periphery of case space, we get a lot of sort of edges here. So in general, that edge information is at the uh, higher portions, sort of higher frequencies, uh, where, uh, you know, the sort of the blurry image, the main contrast and things comes from these lower parts of K-space. The other important concept to understand is that really the sum of these sines and cosines, that is the Fourier series, really can create any other function. So, for example, here, if I have a square wave, you know, I can sort of represent that with a sine wave, as you can see here. It looks pretty close to the square wave, but it doesn't quite capture these sharp boundaries uh, of the square wave. So to do that, we could add another sine wave to that, and you can see it's starting to get a little bit sharper. And if we add another sine wave to that and keep adding them, you can see it slowly starts getting very much like, uh, looking much more like the square wave. So in this way, really, any object can be expressed as a sum of different spatial frequencies. So in a brain, for example, we could actually represent that brain as a sum of different spatial frequencies. And that's essentially what we're sampling when we're 
sampling the data in case space. Another important property of this case space is that it's actually symmetric. Uh, more precisely, it has a complex conjugate symmetry. So the data that we acquired, these signals, um, have both a magnitude to them and a phase of this oscillation that we're looking at. So magnitude and phase, or you can think of it as a real and imaginary components of a complex signal. And if you map that out in case space, there's actually some symmetry here. Uh, it's sort of symmetric along this diagonal axis. So one thing we could do if we wanted to save some time is we could say, well, let's just acquire only half of the data because this is really where all the information is. And given that, we can then flip that over and fill in the rest of case space. Now, in practice, um, because most of the uh, signal is at the center of case space, it's actually really important that we get that. And so there's usually a few overscan lines that where we're scanning just a little bit above, or over just you know, not exactly acquired half of the image, where we're getting close to pretty much just half of the image. Um, and then you can use that information also make sure you have the center of case space, find exactly where the center of case space is, flip that around, and then fill in the rest of the information. And we can completely retrieve our image just acquiring only half of the case space. So benefit of that is that we can acquire it, uh, a factor of f shorter. So if we have a half case space, we're going to acquire half of it. Uh, our imaging time is reduced by a factor of two. But we are acquiring less signals, so our signal to noise ratio, or, or SNR, is reduced by a square root of the factor of two. A few other properties. Now, in this, I'm going to show what happens with different kinds of samples in K space and what it looks like in real space, our actual image that we're trying to get. So, if let's say we don't acquire all of K space, we just acquire the center of K space, what would our image look like? Well, we're not going out as far in K space, so we're only collecting low frequencies. So just as that example I showed before, we're essentially getting a blurrier image, right? And another way to say that is that we're getting a lower resolution image. So we have fewer voxels in our image, but the same field of view. Now, what would happen if I collected only every other data point in K space, but I go out just as far? Well, in this case, our resolution is gonna be the same. We're going same far out in K space, However, we have fewer voxels, we have fewer data points. So if we have fewer voxels with the same resolution, that means a smaller field of view. So notice this kind of relationship here that the distance between points in k-space is related to how far you are going out in real space, the field of view. And similarly, the resolution in real space, that is the distance between the points in real space, is essentially related to how far we're going out in k-space. There's a sort of symmetrical relationship. Now, why am I introducing this? Well, let's see what happens when um, you reduce the field of view. Now, in this case, okay, let's say we've reduced the field of view such that parts of the brain are actually outside the field of view. Maybe we're interested in just zooming in on a certain brain structure. Well, as it turns out, we're still applying, we're still exciting, you know, sending in a radio wave to the entire head, and we're still collecting the signal from that entire head. What actually happens if you look at the image from this, you get sort of a messed up image like this. We'll call it as an aliased image where the parts of the brain that, we, that are outside the field of view get wrapped in. And so what would have been out here actually appears at the beginning of the brain and vice versa, the front of the head, we can see the nose right here, appears at the back. Now, why is that happening? Well, to understand that, I'm gonna talk about a concept called aliasing. And this actually has to do with uh, the fact that we're digitally sampling, that we're, we're getting discrete data points rather than just a continuous signal. So in red is a nice sine wave here, continuous signal, and in blue dots, I'm showing where I'm sampling that signal. So if I'm sampling it fast enough, you can see we nicely reproduce this particular frequency. Now here, if I sample at only every peak and every trough, that's sort of uh, the slowest I can go and still represent this, it still represents this particular frequency. However, if I sample slower than this, right here in the middle, what happens is that if you plot these points and connect them, it actually starts looking like a different frequency. So in other words, if I'm looking at my frequencies along the x-axis here, and this is my Nyquist frequency, and the Nyquist frequency is basically that your sampling frequency has to be at least twice the frequency that we're intending to sample, because you have to be able to capture every peak and every trough. If, whatever, if there's actually frequencies outside of that that higher than our Nyquist frequency, what happens is that that frequency gets aliased into a lower frequency. 
So looking again at, here's another example of aliasing. If we're acquiring the data from the entire volume of what we've excited, the entire head, but there's information out here, essentially at higher frequencies within k-space, higher oscillations within the k-space, we're not actually sampling that because we're just sampling too coarsely, that gets wrapped and looks suddenly appears as a different frequency and that gets aliased here to the back. So now consider we want to do a sagittal acquisition that is sort of slicing midway down uh, here. Can you see some potential problems with this? Well, with this particular acquisition, the other thing to remember is we're acquiring this in different lines of k-space like this. So imagine we just have a typical conventional acquisition with multiple different echoes here. This is our frequency encoding direction, and here we have the different phase encoding steps. Now, one problem might be that anything outside the field of view, you know, that is still excited by the radio frequency wave, would get wrapped in uh, to the image. Now, one thing we can do is that because we are actually acquiring this signal uh, analog initially, you know, through the actual uh, cables and wires from, that are making up the RF coil, before we digitize that signal, we can actually put that through a filter and filter out any higher frequencies uh, that are in that, that are going to be higher than the sampling frequency that we're going to be dealing with. Unfortunately, we can't do that in the phase encoding direction. Really, our discrete is our, our or sampling frequency essentially is already set by how far apart these phase encoding steps are. Uh, and so while we can apply filters in the frequency encoding direction, we can't do that in the phase encoding direction. So bottom line lesson is that if you want to acquire sagittal slices, we can put the frequency encoding direction along the inferior superior axis because then anything that is excited out here outside the field of view, we can filter that out and have it not wrap in. But anything out here, Fortunately, the way the body is designed, we don't have uh, any tissues that we're interested in outside the field of view here, so we don't have that getting wrapped in. So finally, uh, let's take a look. This is just uh, sort of foreshadowing uh, the one of the next lectures talking about parallel imaging. That is, what happens if we only acquire every other line in k-space? You would just reduce the field of view just in that direction. That is, coarser sampling in one direction is related to a smaller field of view in that direction. So hopefully this has given you some insight into the properties of K-space and the usefulness of thinking of how we're acquiring the data uh, by essentially scanning